We say God loves us. We write about it, sing about it, post online about it, but we struggle to truly believe it. Maybe we've experienced the gospel at some point, but we moved on, thinking it was for those who've never heard it before. But we've still got our secret sins, relationships that are broken. After all, how can we expect to love others if we don't really believe that God loves us unconditionally? The gospel is the most beautiful thing we've ever heard. And yet, it just seems so unbelievable. How can one man's story change our own? It's just too good to be true. Or is it? Amen. The gospel is incredible news. Friends, are you glad that you've been here the last few nights? Hallelujah. Man, I am so glad that each one of you are here with us in person. Those of you watching online, we're so glad that you're here as well. You can chat in that side panel. Tell us where you're from. What I want you to do here, I want you to turn to someone, just give them a little hello, greet them for a moment. And then I want to encourage each one of you to sing and worship with us as we jump into our worship here right now this morning, afternoon. Well, I want to thank you so much, those of you who have who have come out. Some of you are not from our local area. My name is Philip. I'm one of the University Church pastors. I help with the young adult ministry. We have several other pastors on our team, and on behalf of all of our team and our leaders, we are so grateful that you've chosen to join us. In your pews, there are one or two people around you who are our pew hosts. And they are here to serve you in any capacity. If you want to know where something is, the restroom, if you'd like to get any other information or just to be greeted by someone that's uh, here locally, a leader in the area. If you're a pew host, could you raise your hand so those around you know who you are? Go ahead and raise your hand. Keep your hands up if you are a pew host. All right. So those of you around you know who they are. Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 60, arise, let your light shine. One of the most beautiful things that I would tell every single person who hears the gospel is that the light of Christ will shine forth and bring hope to the darkness in any area of your life. The gospel is transformative in that it gives us freedom from our sins, but also gives us freedom from the bondage of things that have been holding us back in our life. I want to thank you so much for making a commitment to be here. Thank you for making a commitment to say, I want to start this new year off with the gospel at the center of my life. It takes a commitment to walk with Jesus. Some people forget that at times and think it just kind of happens. But it takes you saying yes to the Lord who's searching and seeking after every single one of us. And so friends, regardless of what journey you're on, you maybe are, feel like you're a baby Christian or not one at all, or you've been walking with Jesus for the longest time. The cross of Christ and the hope of the gospel is good for us all. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for opening up your heart to Jesus. Worship with us now. Let's stand together and worship. song for some but it is very easy it's about the goodness of God so if you know this sing it with us let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the 
The next song that we're going to sing together is a reflective song, um, and I think you will find it to be very powerful. The chorus is very simple. It says, I want to see the love all around you. I want to know that love is all around you. Calling them names again We give 
our peace away. I hope they see it, cause I want to see it. I hope we believe it, cause I want to see it. This afternoon, I'd actually like to ask you to be seated, if you would, please, and just say a word or two before our prayer time together. I don't know if it has to do with the, the amount of gray in my beard, but over the years, my experience of and focus in prayer has changed. For a lot of my early life, my prayer was about getting answers. You know, A, B, C, ask, believe, and claim. But when I grew up, I think I put some childish things behind me and have come to think of prayer as a way to ask God to align me with what God is doing in the world and to align me with His purposes for my life and what He desires next. And I think that's what we can do with prayer here this afternoon is in a moment, I'm going to ask those of you who are able to, if you would kneel with me. And uh, as we kneel, 
is, as the music plays, I'm just going to take a few seconds of silence and just ask you in your own heart to open yourself to God. Say, God, I don't know what you're doing here this afternoon for everyone else, but I know I want you to do something in my life. I know I want you to reorder my priorities, to rearrange my schedule, to revitalize my relationships, and especially to reconnect me with you. So could we do that? I'm going to invite again those, if you're not able to kneel, uh, no worries, just those who are able, if you would kneel with us, and we're going to take just a bit of time in the quiet and ask you to commune with our good and gracious God, and then I'll close with prayer. Gracious God, in the stillness, with the beauty of the music we just sang still ringing in our ears, the quiet tones of the musicians playing now, we just open our hearts and souls to you. It's a joy to be together. We're still basking in the glow of last night and this morning, and we're thankful for the privilege of once again trying to understand your ways in the world. So be present with us now. Do what you would with us in this place that we might go out into the world and join what you're doing. I pray that you would be with Ty, that you would give him guidance, clarity, and conviction. Might your spirit be present. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Lunch is a formidable force to deal with. Did you have a good lunch? I'm preaching through tamales, straight through the tamales I had. I don't know what I'm preaching into, but this is not nap time. So I'll be watching, all right? I don't know who made the tamales that I had, but man, oh man. Those were some good tamales, and the salsa was incredible. I am full of tamales and salsa right now. I just want you to know that. But uh, speaking of salsa, would you mind if I tell you a story about salsa? Do you like salsa stories? You probably don't even know a single salsa story. I'm going to tell you a salsa story. So years ago, my wife, Sue, had gone to all the trouble to make this amazing Mexican dinner. And I, from a distance, I was watching these tacos come into shape. It was just, oh, I was just so eager. I love eating. It's one of my favorite things to do. And just before these tacos were about to be served, she realized there was a key ingredient missing. There was no salsa in the house. This is a problem. This is a big problem. So she says to me, Ty, we don't have any salsa. Could you go to the grocery store and get some salsa? And with a little bit of an attitude, she said, and make it fast. <laughs> now, there's a context to this attitude because her and I have different shopping techniques. My wife shops like a man like a pinball in a pinball machine. She has a short list in her head. She goes in and she bounces around to just get the items that she already knows she wants. This is boring. <laughs> I, on the other hand, I have a method that I believe is superior to her method. <laughs> every time I walk in the grocery store, I go all the way to the right. And I go up and down every aisle <laughs> twice. <laughs> and this is why I'm the only person in our home that ever discovers any new yummy stuff. 
She buys the same thing over and over and over again, and I'm, I'm making discoveries. <laughs> so she says, fast, Ty, please, fast. I'm ready, could you just go get salsa? Don't, don't go up and down every aisle is what's between the lines there. In fact, she won't allow me to go to the grocery store with her. If I see her trying to sneak out of the house, and I think, this may be a grocery store run, I'll say, can I go, please? And she'll say, please, no. And if you're going to go shopping with me, bring your own car and get your own cart. And that's not shopping together. So on this occasion, I was determined to prove that I could shop like a man. So I went to the store. I went immediately to the salsa aisle. I know where it's at. Resisting the temptation to go all the way to the right. But I am confronted with a problem. There is a woman very studiously standing in front of all the salsa, examining the options. I'm in a hurry, but I'm also polite. So I come up behind her, allowing appropriate space, just examining over her shoulders, waiting my turn. And as I'm waiting for my opportunity to reach in and grab some salsa and get out of the store and get home and have some tacos, as I'm looking over her shoulder, something completely unexpected and kind of flattering takes place. This woman reaches back her hand, tenderly clasps mine in hers. <laughs> and there's something you need to know about me. When somebody's holding my hand and I'm nervous, I, 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 I clasp a little tighter for some reason. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So as we're standing there in the salsa aisle holding hands, and she's looking forward, examining the options. She says to me in, I might add, a rather romantic tone. <laughs> she says, medium or hot, sweetie pie. <laughs> now, I'm in a quandary at this point, because on the one hand, I know this is a case of mistaken identity. I know I am not sweetie pie. <laughs> on the other hand, I have very, very specific opinions about salsa. And she did ask. <laughs> so as I'm trying to decide what to do, getting more and more nervous as the seconds tick by, and all of this happened just in a matter of seconds, you have to see it in slow motion because that's how it happened. Just as she says, medium or hot, sweetie pie, she in slow motion is turning toward me and I see in her profile a pucker developing. <laughs> So I begin to grip a little tighter and lean back toward the spaghetti sauce. <laughs> and as I lean back, I say, actually, ma'am, I prefer mild salsa. And as I'm explaining the necessity of the salsa being mild, so that you can taste the subtle fusion of the cilantro and the tomatoes and the lime juice and the, ah, oh, mild, everybody. You gotta taste the flavors. Just as I'm explaining, our eyes lock, her pucker sucks in. <laughs> she realizes I'm not sweetie pie. She screams and runs out of the aisle. <laughs> so I grabbed some salsa and got out of that place, hoping <laughs> that sweetie pie wasn't six foot six of solid tattoo covered muscles. That's what I was hoping. <laughs> now looking in the store for this twerp that was holding his girl's hand in the salsa aisle. So I go home. I deliver the salsa, and I realize that as I'm enjoying these tacos, she's back there at the grocery store searching for her true love. And that's why I told you the story. <laughs> Welcome to part three of Unbelievable. God in the flesh. God in the flesh. The most monumental thing that has ever happened in all of universal history God didn't merely relocate geographically. He didn't simply move from one place to another place in the universe. The God of the universe voluntarily underwent a, I guess we could call it a transmigration of nature. He didn't just move from point A to point B. He, he literally became something he had never been. God, who had only ever been God, according to the account of this unbelievable narrative, 
God became one of us. Now, he became one of us to meet something deep and specific inside of us. What that woman was experiencing is what all of us experience. And I'm going to suggest to you that our insatiable search for love is evidence. It is proof that something transcendent is going on in the world, in our hearts, in the universe. Our insatiable hunger, our thirst, our desire to love and be loved is pointing us in the right direction. We're crossing the bridge in our series from the so-called Old Testament narrative, what we prefer to call the Hebrew scriptures, into the so-called New Testament, the Messianic scriptures. We are making our journey from that part of the story to that part of the story that now leads us face to face with the reality that God's love for you and me is so profound, so deep, so passionate, that God himself would rather undergo a complete change of nature and to enter into eternal solidarity with us as a member of the human race rather than to live without us. Now, last night we discovered, according to the biblical narrative, our origins are pretty profound if you just stop and think about it. According to scripture, God made mankind, humankind, in God's own image. Now, we interpreted that last night along these lines, that God made us with the capacity to love like God loves, with with other-centered orientation. God made us looking out of ourselves, not looking in to ourselves and at ourselves. I exist for you. You exist for me. You've got my back. I don't need to have my back. But there's a problem. Nobody has anybody's back anymore. The selfishness principle was introduced into human psychology and has bled over into all kinds of survival mechanisms. So that this morning, what we discovered in part two of our series together, you remember that David pointed out that the fall of mankind involved, first and foremost, a vertical disintegration of relationship between us and our maker, between us and God. And that vertical disintegration of relationship then began to manifest immediately between Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel, and you've read the story, no doubt, or at least have a rough sense of what that story is, that horizontally everything began to fall apart. So that all of the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures, with one voice, but through many symbols and prophecies and various kinds of communication techniques, including songs, by the way, The music has been beautiful. I read a philosopher years ago, an agnostic philosopher who was trying to figure out whether or not he could believe in the existence of God. So he was working his way through all the academic arguments, the ontological argument for the existence of God, the cosmological argument for the existence of God. He was working his way through the teleological argument for the existence of God, and he was not persuaded. And then he came to the conclusion. He said, if music alone was the only evidence on the table, I would have to believe in the existence of God. The fact that we process reality with a romantic orientation, whether it is between husbands and wives, parents and children, or adoring worshipers, of a transcendent God. The fact that we are so oriented toward a romantic processing of reality is evidence that we are something far more than mere scratching, clawing, kicking animals. We are profoundly made in the image of God and the fact that we long for love is evidence of what we are and what we've lost And we're all like amnesia victims. Every time we hear a beautiful song or see a 
hillside covered with wildflowers or see two children, a brother and a sister laughing their heads off in a park, swinging around and falling to the ground laughing, something inside of us is telling us we were made for that. We were made for laughter and beauty and romance and salsa, tamales, and sitting at tables with people without acrimony, without hate, without division. We were made for love. Psychologically, emotionally, even biologically, we are wired for it. If you're wondering what you are, not who you are, the who question is pretty fascinating as well. You're a particular who. I'm a particular who. I'm Thai. I'm a specific individual. You're, I don't know, Bob, Susan, Frank, Ferdinand. You're a specific who. But what are you? Well, you're, you're according to the biblical narrative, you're a love machine of some kind. You're a, you're a love apparatus of some kind. Just, just, just test that out. Turn to the person sitting next to you right now and say, you're a love apparatus, baby. <laughs> <laughs> or don't do it if the person sitting next to you would find it creepy. <laughs> the point is this. We are particular kinds of creatures. We are made for receiving and giving love on various different levels, and our insatiable search for love is telling us the truth of who we are. I want to bring your attention in this light to the fact that on the, the front edge of biological, psychological, and sociological science, there is this entire new and growing body of research that is actually, that is actually demonstrating that what Scripture has been saying all along is true. In the remarkable book, one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years, The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, he puts forth the premise that, yes, the body keeps the score because everything that happens to us psychologically impacts us biologically. Every psychological and emotional and relational trauma makes a mark on our physiology as human beings. We're integrated creatures. We're holistic creatures. Let me put it to you this way. You're not suited for anything but love. So that anything other than love is a disruption to your identity and is traumatizing. You're not built for anything other than goodness and beauty and truth. You are never, ever supposed to experience words like, I hate you, I wish you were never born. You are never, ever, ever supposed to hear angry words or even an angry tone of voice. You are, you are not wired for it. You're not psychologically set up to handle hostility, hatred of any kind. And so anything contrary to love wounds us. And so... Dr. Van der Kolk tells us that essentially the whole planet, all of the human race, we're a trauma ward. We're all traumatized to one degree or another to the degree that we have experienced either vacancy wounds or violation wounds. Violation wounds are the kinds of wounds that are inflicted on us when somebody does something to us that ought not to have been done. Vacancy wounds occur when something that ought to, been, ought to have been done for us was not done for us. My example would be I never had a father, but I'm meant to have a father. Psychologically, I was supposed to have that affirming presence in my life from the beginning. The absence of a thing can be traumatizing. The presence of something that goes against the grain of love is traumatizing. Dr. Van der Kolk essentially says that the whole human race is traumatized and he's not a theologian, he's not trying to do anything religious as far as I can tell, he's just looking at the data. And according to the data, Van der Kolk informs us that in fact trauma almost invariably, almost invariably involves not being seen, not being mirrored, not being taken into account. Almost invariably, if you are alone 
in the world, you are in the process of being wounded. Whether you consciously pause to process that reality or not. But then he goes in this very interesting direction. Feeling listened to and understood changes our, our very physiology. Isn't that amazing? We have evidence now in a field of study called epigenetics that demonstrates, in fact, that even if you and I have positive eye contact, and I reach out and I shake your hand, the moment flesh-on-flesh -flesh contact occurs with a positive spirit between us, your white blood cell count goes up and so does mine. We become more viable creatures in that moment. Incrementally, you and I are made better physiologically by the psychological and social interaction of love on any level. Now imagine living in that kind of social and relational environment nonstop. Imagine your life just being a continuum of small, incremental, loving, kind, courteous, beautiful interactions. Your immune system would be off the charts all the time. So another thing that we need to understand as we look at the biblical narrative is Scripture has been telling us all along that empathy is healing. That love in the form of, how did Dr. Vanderkolk articulate it? Feeling listened to, seen, taken into account is healing physiologically. This is empathy. This is when somebody takes note of your existence, of my existence, with a pleasant attitude. Empathy is healing. Dr. Brene Brown, an amazing researcher who has apparently read 200,000 pieces of data. She spends a lot of time reading. I hope she's got an exercise program going on. <laughs> if you ask me, Brene Brown says, if you ask me the one thing I know for sure, after 200,000 pieces of data, now she's speaking as a scientist, so the context here is, there's a lot that I'm not sure about, because I need empirical evidence for everything. So she's saying, I have evidence for this. I've read 200,000 pieces of data. She's speaking as a, as a, as a scientist, as, a, as an academic. She's not speaking as a theologian. She says, if you ask me the one thing I know for sure, this is, this is certain, after reading 200,000 pieces of data, I know that in the absence of love and belonging, there's always suffering. That I know for sure. I don't know a whole lot else. I'm still doing a lot of reading on other fronts of research. There are things I don't know, but the one thing I do know is that in the absence of love and belonging, there is always suffering. Now, if you just pause and think this through, you will know intuitively that is, this is true in your own experience. That you always flourish in the context of empathy and love and you begin to wither without it. Even if you're an introvert. I'm an introvert. I know that even those of us who are more inclined to have time alone are delighted to have social circles and to be affirmed in those social circles. Now, when we cross the bridge into the New Testament, as David read this morning, Matthew's gospel, which is the first gospel we have in the New Testament scriptures, telling the story of Messiah, the scripture in Matthew, the first words you read in the New Testament are these, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, dot, dot, dot. The story unfolds. Now, each of the four Gospels are telling the same story from different perspectives, right? So you have the, the Gospel of Matthew, which begins with a genealogy. And then you have the Gospel of, of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, and then you have John. And John's Gospel, very fascinatingly, begins in a different place. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the word word here, as you probably know, is the word logos. What does that word logos mean? It has a, it has a deep, rich, etymological history in Greek culture and in the Greek language, even prior to its usage here in the New Testament by 
the Apostle John. Logos is a word that means something like the rational premise of all of reality. Or to use maybe a modern technological metaphor, logos is something like the operating system of reality. It's the thing behind the thing behind the thing behind the thing that gives meaning and significance, form and functionality to all things. This is logos. Now, the logos in Greek understanding was eternal, transcendent, and rational. Plato talked about this. Aristotle talked about it. The Stoics talked about it. It's eternal, it's transcendent, it's rational. They also believed it was universally accessible to anybody who just pauses to do what they called philosophy. Anybody who pauses to think, to process reality, you would tap into logos. Now, it's very interesting that from Plato's standpoint, the logos, and ultimately what he would sometimes call God, or the gods, he equated with absolute being, just sheer totality of being. And because God is absolute, God occupies all the space in the universe. God is absolute being. So nothing happens adjacent to God. There is no such thing in the truest sense of God and a distinctive adjacent you. You exist within the parameters of God's absolute being so that all of reality, including your life and everything that you will do from this point forward and everything you've done in the past, all of it was predetermined in the mind of the absolute being that is God. So you're always catching up to the chapter in your story that was already written. You don't exist as an autonomous, free, liberated, adjacent being to God. Sometimes this is called, and it developed into something called pantheism. All is God and God is all, which means there is nothing distinct from God. So you never have a thought, a feeling, you never experience anything that is not the predetermined, prescripted will of God. Now, the primary student of Plato was Aristotle. Aristotle came along and he said, well, if, if, if that premise is true, if God is absolute, and there is nothing that occurs outside of the parameters of God's own consciousness, so that there is no adjacency to God, well, Aristotle concluded and coined a term that you've probably heard, that God must be then the unmoved mover. He remains unmoved by all apparently external phenomenon, unmoved, but he's the one doing all the moving. He's the puppet master. He's the one that's causing all things that ever happen. He is not himself ever, listen, acted upon. God can't experience anything external to himself. And in Christian theology, beginning with a guy named Augustine, and then perfected into a fine theological art with John Calvin, both of whom, by the way, were towering intellects who contributed many great things to Christian theology. But both of them developed the idea based on Plato and Aristotle of divine impassibility. The idea of divine impassibility is that God, being absolute and in Christian vernacular, sovereign over all, God can never experience anything external to God that God himself is not the cause of. And therefore, God is impassable. You hear the word pathos there, from which we get the word passion and feelings and emotions. So God never experiences any movement. What are emotions? Well, the root word for emotion is motion or movement, right? When you have an emotional experience, there's activity inside of you. There's no activity inside of God that is acted upon or stimulated by anything external to God. Are you tracking with me? I know this is a little weird, but 
This is the idea of logos in Greek philosophy and as it has been grafted into much of Christian theology as well. So God experiences nothing external to God. God is impassable. Now, according to the biblical narrative, though, here's the, here's the massive innovation, and the word innovation is, it does not suffice. This is, this is groundbreaking. This is revolutionary. The apostle John comes along, and he puts, he puts pen to paper. He puts, he puts quill to parchment. And he says, you know that logos? the Greeks are talking about? Plato, Aristotle? You know, you know the operating system of reality? The rational core? You know the thing behind the thing behind the thing that is ultimate? Well, the logos that they've been talking about became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, and it was interpersonal, suddenly. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of, full of two relational dynamics. There's flow. There's something going out and something coming in. There's adjacency. There's autonomy. There's love and freedom in this paradigm of reality. Grace and truth, as, as the equilibrium of the character of God. Try to imagine reality coming at you full steam ahead, and all it is is truth. You would disintegrate in the face of it. You and I are not capable of processing even the full, unmitigated truth about ourselves, let alone the truth about every other self in the world. Truth is supplemented by grace. It, it, it's kind of like God is constantly saying, let me tell you, let me tell you something about me so I can tell you something about yourself so that we can come into greater and greater synchronicity and harmony together, you and me. It, it's kind of like God is saying that the way you're going to be healed of all your trauma is to be perfectly known truth, and perfectly loved simultaneously. Now just pause and let your mind rest on that thought. And you'll know immediately that all of your good relationships, every good relationship that you have is a relationship in which you know the person knows something about you that you're not proud of, and yet they keep hanging around. They're still there for you. They still love you. To be perfectly known and perfectly loved simultaneously is the essence of our healing. It's what you want. It's what I want. You want to be seen as you are, but still loved. And Jesus comes into the world to pull that off to accomplish that reality so that the Logos in the New Testament sense is a quantum leap rationally, intellectually, spiritually. It's a quantum leap beyond the Greek idea. Logos in the New Testament, yes, it's eternal, but it's also temporal. God stepped in to time with us. It's, it's transcendent. Yes, it is, but it is not only transcendent, it's, it's eminent. It's, it's here in space with us. It's not only rational, the Logos is rational, but it's also emotional. Which is to say, because John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that the Logos is none other than God. Which is to say that God is eternal and temporal. That God is transcendent and eminent. That God is rational and emotional. We were blessed by those beautiful songs. Are you aware of the fact that, that in Scripture, the Bible explicitly tells us that God himself, the creator of the universe, is a singer and a songwriter? Now, you know what kind of people sing. And even if you, even if you don't sing, oh, you love to hear it. Because you're a romantic at heart. 
You want to be romanced by life and reality and some heart that intersects with your heart. You're made for adoration. You're made to reach out of yourself. It is a profound thing to realize that scripture says that God himself is a singer and a songwriter. It's Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. I will rejoice over you with singing, the God of the universe says. Which is to say that God is emotional. God is not pure rationality. God is pure rationality coupled with pure emotionality. God is this beautiful fusion of both. According to the biblical narrative, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Ontologically, culturally, and socially, God relocated to where we are. He came all the way down, but not just making a geographic journey. Even on the social level, Scripture, just, just imagine, this is God we're talking about here. The God of the universe looked down upon our pitiful, broken, busted, messed up situation. And he said, we got to save them. We've got to heal them. we got to redeem them. What shall we do? I know. Let's go and, and the scripture says, the son of man came eating and drinking. I'll go eat and drink with them. That's how I'll save them. I'll go hang out with them around tables. Please pass the baba ganoush. A little bit more salsa down this way, please. God, across the table from you and me, in the person of Christ. The Son of Man came into our world to socialize us back into his company, to bring us back in to loving relationship with himself. So according to the biblical narrative, God came down to us in humility. This is John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came down to us in humility. He came close to us in empathy. And he came as us, as one of us, in solidarity. To put on display the fact that he feels what we feel. That his experiences intersect with our experiences. That God is not aloof, separate, distant but very present, very present. One Bible version, interestingly enough, translates that part of John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. One Bible translation says God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's what happened. He came near. He came close to us. And why did he do it? Well, that was verse 14 of John 1 that we read. Now, look very carefully at verse 18. We're just going a few verses later, and this is explaining God's own rationale for taking up residence in our flesh. The Bible says that no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom, that is, in close relationship with the Father, in intimacy with the Father. Back in the 1950s, men used to say that they had bosom buddies. I don't say that anymore. I have buddies. I have friends. I have dudes that are my friends. I don't want them anywhere near my bosom. <laughs> we don't use that kind of terminology anymore, but you get the point, right? Like, dude, I love you, but get away from my bosom. <laughs> yeah, that's how you feel, right? Bosom. This is poetry. This is a metaphor for intimacy, closeness. Jesus comes into the world, and if you say, hey, what's your point of origin? Where did you come from? Where do you hail from? He says, I came from the bosom, from close, intimate union, from relational union with the Father. That's, that's where I came from, and I'm here now with you. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to bring you back into that close, intimate union with the Father. That's why he's here. Jesus comes into the world from the bosom of the Father. He knows the Father. We don't. But he does, and he says, I'm here to declare him, to reveal him, to disclose God to you. So that he's so proximate to who and what we are that the scripture describes him as experiencing our experiences on the full range of human emotion. The Bible literally says that Jesus wept, which is to say God in the flesh wept. And when we see Jesus weeping, just a few chapters later, the same Jesus says, hey, hey, wait a minute, all this that you see in me, everything that you're encountering with me, 
When you see the tears flow, when you see me receiving the little children into my company and the disciples, also known as his bodyguards, I guess, were trying to protect him from the little kids. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Don't forbid them. Let them come. Let the kids come. Let them come. Picture children crawling all over Jesus and braiding his beard and putting flowers in his hair. That's God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, the incarnation of God in Christ was an infinite and all-encompassing act of enfleshed empathy. This is not dry academic theology. The Bible is telling us a story about a God who is head over heels in love with you and me and doing everything possible to enter into fellowship with us and to introduce us back in to relationship with him. From, from, from our Greek heritage as Westerners, we are, we are obsessed with the omnipotence of God. God is all-powerful. We love that. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Oh, it's all true. God is omnipresent. Oh. We're so obsessed with the transcendent attributes that we forget so that we didn't even coin the term. You won't even find it in the dictionary unless you and I start using it rather frequently and then every year the Oxford English Dictionary adds new words. There's no reason why we couldn't talk this up and get it in the dictionary. <laughs> God is omnipotent, yes he is. God is omniscient, yes he is. God is omnipresent, yes he is. God is omnipassionate. God is the epicenter of all pure, good, and beautiful emotions. He feels all the feelings in the world. When, when we encounter Jesus in the flesh, the scripture tells us that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Do you feel anything? God feels it. The author Ellen White, I brought a statement to you from this same book last night, The Desire of Ages. One of the most beautiful sentences I've ever read personally. I've never been able to get it off my mind from the day that I read it as a teenager when I was like 18 years old. I read these words and I've been quoting it to myself ever since. Not a sigh is breathed. Pause right there. What's a sigh? Do a sigh so we know what we're talking about here. What's a sigh? It's not a scream. It's a sigh. A sigh is the slightest expression of discomfort. Not even a sigh is breathed. Not a pain is felt. Not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. This is, this is some kind of emotional sympathetic vibration that's going on in the universe between us and God. It's not hard to understand because we experience it even on the human level. You know for a fact that the more you love someone, the more you feel what they feel, right? And we're broken and messed up. We're jaded. And we feel what is felt by those we love. My, my daughter, Amber, is a laugher. I don't even know what she's laughing about sometimes, and I'm giggling. Because when she laughs, I'm laughing. There's just, it's, it's automatic. I'm like, what, what is it? Tell me. Are you telling yourself a joke in your head? Tell me. What's funny? But if I look across the room and I see tears forming in my wife Sue's eyes, I might not even know the source of the tears. But I need to know. I want to know. I have to know. Because even before I know the rational dimension of the thing she's experiencing, I feel the emotional dimension of the thing. Because we were made in the image of God. God, according to scripture, feels all the pain in the world. You can't, I can't, we're finite, he's infinite. God has infinite emotional capacity to feel all the feelings in the world simultaneously. So John 3.16, which is probably the most familiar verse in the Bible, says it like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to notice something maybe you haven't noticed before. We have here the world and whosoever. 
The world is the big idea. So, so I could make a perfectly accurate biblical theological statement if I said God loves everybody. God loves the whole world. It's a little impersonal. God loves everybody. Let us close with prayer. But listen carefully. You reside in the whosoever part of the verse. Yes, God loves all. God loves all precisely because God loves each. I love all of my children because I love each of my children. I don't love my three children as a nameless mass of three. I love them each by name according to their experience and my personal history with each one of them. I know them. God loves all of us precisely because God loves each of us. In a book called Steps to Christ by that same author, this book was written over 100 years ago, profoundly tells us that the relations, the relations between God and each soul, the relations between God and each soul, just process this, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. What? Is God like that? Yes, God's like that. C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis puts it like this. C.S. Lewis says he, that's Jesus, died not for men, humans in general, he died not for men, but for each man, each human. If each man had been the only man made, he would have done no less. Do you believe it? The moment you begin to believe that God's love has that general shape to it, to know and to believe that God loves like that will completely change the quality and course of your life. It did for me when I was 18 years old. When I was 18 years old, as an atheist, surfer, skateboarder kid from Los Angeles, somebody said to me, God is love, and I laughed. And then I paused, and I began to think it through, because I had only thought that if God exists, that must equate to just sheer power. Now suddenly I was face to face with the profound idea that, that yes, God is all-powerful, but what if God is love? In the most beautiful sense imaginable. There is a sense in which you are alone in the universe with God. Right now, we're in a room full of people, a lot of people all around us, and there's a sense in which right now you and God are alone in the universe, and the moment you realize that God loves you like that, suddenly you're together with everybody around you in a whole new way. You begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. If God loves me like that, now I begin to see you as the object of God's love. Without controversy, Paul says, great is the mystery of godliness. There is a mystery to it. We confess more than we can comprehend, or you can't get through the Bible. <laughs> you can't get through life. We confess more than we can fully comprehend. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was. He was justified in the spirit. That is to say, he was vindicated before the world and the universe. He was seen by angels. They were blown away by what they were witnessing. The angels looking at this profound condescension and saying to themselves, wow, God really loves them. He was preached among the Gentiles and believed on in the world and then received back up into glory, bearing our flesh. Eternally one of us. God forever in solidarity with the human race. Back to that book, Desire of Ages, for a moment. In taking our nature, in taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie 
that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. He gave him, that is, God the Father gave him, Jesus, not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. Eternally. To become one of the human family forever to retain his human nature. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heavens. An actual member of the human race this moment occupies the throne of the universe. One of us occupies the throne of the universe. Mark Knoll, in his fascinating book, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind, says to confess the material reality of the incarnation is to perceive an unusual dignity in the material world itself. Listen, listen, listen. We ourselves, as fallen human beings, like the rest of creation, groan within ourselves because of our fallen, broken, dysfunctional, traumatized condition. And we eagerly wait for the adoption that is the redemption of our body. Listen, listen very carefully. Your body isn't bad, it's just royally messed up. The Greek idea is this strict bifurcation between flesh and spirit. The biblical narrative says, no, no, God himself dignified human nature by becoming a member of the human race and bearing our flesh himself. Hans Earl von Balthasar. If you have a name like that, you better say something amazing. <laughs> Swiss theologian, deceased now, incredible insight. Love alone is credible. He's talking here about God in the flesh. The only thing that would be persuasive is God in the flesh. Nothing else can be believed. Nothing else should be believed. Listen, the bottom line is this. Rationalism in the logos sense alone is debatable. We can academically debate all day long. I'll tell you what, though, love is irrefutable. And what we have is Jesus in the flesh is irrefutable proof that God loves you and me. Part three of Unbelievable. Thanks for your time. tonight was a very pivotal moment for us. Um, it was a really incredible message. Let's close out the Sabbath together, shall we? Let's stand together and sing Be Thou My Vision.
Father in heaven, we want to ask you to bring this message very close to our minds and our hearts. May we not only know it, but feel it and begin to experience it in, in all of our relational dynamics. Mm. Father, please help us to see one another mm. through your eyes, the way you see us and in the light of all that you've done for us in Christ. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Friends, we have a few things we want to just share with you. So if you would have a seat just for a moment. Has it not been amazing having Ty and David here? What a blessing. What a blessing, we're, just, we're, 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 we're very blessed to be here. I, I'm sorry I ended so abruptly. We'll forgive the, the, you. The, 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 the clock was telling me I was like 20 or 30 seconds over. It was just staring at me, and I got nervous, and I just said, okay, I'm done. And I left. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> We'll forgive you this time. Okay. Tomorrow night, you better yeah. not. Okay. You better okay. not leave I'm not us. on tomorrow night. David is. That's right. Okay, and we'll tell care. David. <laughs> yeah, he just keeps going. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh, man. Well, we are so glad you guys are here. You know, just tell us a moment. What is Light Bears? Some people maybe oh, are bringing okay. you to your ministry, and they don't know. What, what is Light Bears? Okay, so uh, Light Bears is the ministry that David and I represent. Um, we have a team of people, and... Uh, that ministry um, exists to vindicate, to exonerate, to magnify the beauty of God's character. That's, yeah. that's the whole point. That's the awesome. premise of our thinking is that if you begin with the premise that God is love, what emerges? Mm. That, that, that's the idea. And that ministry um, is, a, is a media ministry. We produce uh, a lot of uh, television media. It's also a publishing ministry. We mm -hmm. publish in multiple different languages around the world. Yeah. Uh, gospel literature free of charge that we ship to countries in Africa, South and Central America, um, Southeast Asia, wow. Eastern Europe. Um, wow. so, so it's a publishing ministry, it's a media ministry, it's a teaching and discipleship ministry. Wow. We run a school um, called Arise that David founded uh, with a friend of his named um, Nathan Renner like 20 years ago and about 12, 13, 14, I don't know, years ago, it became a part of Light Bearers. And so David and I run that school together now mm -hmm. and we run it each year in Australia. And this year, praise God, we're launching uh, the Arise Discipleship course in Finland. It's also an online course that you can become a student anywhere from a grocery store parking lot. You can take the course. Um, it's, called, it's just arise.online. And we go through the entire biblical narrative the uh, curriculum is called The Story, mm. and it's, a, it's, it's basically the study of Scripture in the light of God's love. That's, that's basically what that's it is. That's amazing. So that, you know, that's, what, was, that's what we do. I was one of, get this, in 2020 when the pandemic happened, these guys made their curriculum free just for that one little time, yeah. and you could get full access to it, and I was one of the 20,000 
thousand yeah. some people. Yeah, that's what happens when you say it's free. 20,000 oh people signed up. You're like, oh, shoot, we should have charged 10 bucks. You should have. <laughs> you should have. Oh, man. But thank you so yeah, yeah. much for just yeah. sharing a little bit about that. They'll talk a little bit more about their ministry later. But we want to just encourage you. Friends, this is not just a moment in time to share for yourself. This is about you extending the gift of the gospel to someone. So I want you to do two things. I want you to, A, pray about, God, who do I need to invite to be part of this? Mm. And B, who do I need to share this yeah. message with? They're all archived online. Our media team is incredible. They're archiving everything that we're doing, and we want you to share that with someone. Someone needs to hear about this correction of the image of the character of God for their life. It will transform people. And yeah. so we hope that you would do that. Second, And they send an invitation, not yeah. just the archive online. We'd, we'd love for you to invite some friends or family. Yes. Even if you have teenagers. I know they're yeah. still subhuman, but bring them. <laughs> bring teenagers. Seriously, teenagers can track with this stuff. They yes. love it. So, 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 so bring, invite somebody. Say, hey, come, 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 come with me. If it's a teenager, offer them $100. Just bribe them into coming, and then hopefully they'll come. for the, You won't Ooh. have to pay $100 every night. We'll find someone to find the 100 bucks for them, you know. <laughs> But we really want to encourage you to come out every night. This is going to be happening 6.30 tomorrow night. David is going to be sharing mm. next. We are so looking forward to that message. Tomorrow night, 6.30. The rest of the week, same time, 6.30 every evening. Now, that's every evening. But there's something happening every morning of the week, Monday through Friday. Yes. Right think, here yes. at 11 a.m. for our university students and if you'd like to join, you could sit in the balcony potentially if there's any seats for you. And what are you going to be doing for okay, the so week? Okay, so that's a totally different series called Real Religion, R E A L Religion. It's a play on the word religion. Um, we don't really like religion that much, David and I. We are converts to um, Christ, and we think that uh, there are a lot of religious ideas and religious movements in the world that have given God a bad name. Mm. Um, and there are a lot of people who have a lot of antipathy for religion and even are repulsed by it. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to be trying to frame um, religion in the positive light of the character of God, mm. um, uh, specifically on a little bit more of an academic level for for. for you know, college students who really want to be challenged to yeah, think through yeah. the implications yes. of both the existence of God and the character of God. So that's what that's, that's about. Awesome. And there's uh, five sessions. David and I will also team teach that um, back and forth. I'll do two sessions. David will do two sessions. Um, not in succession. It'll be me, David, me, David. And then the fifth one, we will co-teach. That's awesome. Yeah. That's thank you. awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much, I don't Ty. know what time that is every day. It's, that's going to be at 11 o'clock okay. right here in the sanctuary. It will be... Uh, live streamed on the university chaplain platform, so a little bit different. So thank you so much for mm -hmm. that, brother. Right now, we want to give you an opportunity to take part in worship of giving. And so we would love for each one of you to partner with us in ministry for events just like these. This does take a little bit of finances to make these things happen. And so behind me on the screen, there's a QR code. Behind you, as you're exiting, you could give a donation and a check to LUC Church or in cash. That all goes towards continuing these sort of programs, both for the media ministry and for the event itself. So thank you so much for thinking about us in that way. The last thing I want to share with you is that every evening, again, I told you, we're going to be taking seriously the act of prayer. If you've come this evening with any kind of burden on your heart, we want to give you the opportunity to pray with someone in person. Last night, I had the opportunity to pray with some wonderful people. And I just want to encourage you, if there's any burden on your heart, I know you might have something. Whether it's a, a spousal issue, whether it's a financial issue, whether it's a spiritual issue, our team is here. We would love to pray with you. Join us here to your left online. We'd also love to give you an opportunity for the next 30 minutes. You can join us checking out on the page on our website. You can get the phone number there. And we'd love to have you call in to take part in that as well. Friends, God bless you. We love you. Right outside these doors, turn around through the corner and go to the fellowship hall. We have some lemonade for you. We'd love for you to mingle. Ty will be there. He'd love to meet you as well. Our pastoral team will be there and our leaders from our church. So God bless you, and we'll see you right here tomorrow.